Hello everyone, my name's Emily and welcome back to SunSub, a channel all about how to survive in the online jungle. So, cryptography, what is it? Well, it's the basis of our digital security for a start. Our smartphones and laptops encrypt all the information they store without us even noticing. This process of data conversion takes place on the fly. Every time we open a website, starting with the letters HTTPS, we exchange encrypted traffic. Wireless networks, bank payments, Ethereum smart contracts, and even video calls via Zoom. All of these things depend on cryptography. At the heart of encryption algorithms is the creation of random keys. However, this term random keys presents just a small problem. Spontaneity is not one of the strengths of your computer. Computers worked according to strictly defined algorithms, and it's virtually impossible for an algorithm to get an unpredictable or genuinely random number. Although, if you think coming up with a random number is easy, don't celebrate your superiority over machines too soon, because you're also not capable of it. Let's do a little experiment. Think of a number between one and 10. If I were to tell you that you're thinking of the number seven, then I'd be correct in 28% of cases. And if I suggested that you're thinking of number 10, the likelihood of me guessing correctly is less than 2%. At least this is the claim made by authors of the study I came across on Reddit a few years ago. They posed the same question to eight and a half thousand students and received the following distribution of results. Doesn't it look a lot like people weren't actually able to come up with a random number? The fact is that their choice was influenced by psychology. In Western culture, seven is a lucky number, and some even consider it a magic number. Our brain seeks positive emotions, and therefore, even in such a simple, unimportant situation, it's impossible for us to trust it. This approach might not apply for just one person. Of course, each of us has our own lucky number. But the more people that participate in this game, the more likely it will be that there appears predictable results. With the advent of computers, this is only worsened. The flying toasters, look, see? They're toasters and they're flying and then... Imagine outside your window, it's April 1995. You sit at your computer, slowly browsing the internet on Netscape Navigator, and finally you decide on your first online purchase. You place an order for a book by Douglas Hofstadter, and enter your personal details onto the site. Name, address, your credit card number. Now congratulations, you've just made history. Twice in fact. Firstly, you placed the first order on Amazon.com. Secondly, you used an insecure encryption protocol, which by that time, hackers had already learned to crack. To work over the secure HTTPS protocol, Netscape programmers use non-secure keys. At first glance, a 40-bit key has about a trillion possible combinations. Going through all of them, even on a modern computer, is no easy task. But the problem was that they weren't really random. The generation of these keys used the current time of day and process ID in the system. This meant that the number of possible combinations was reduced by so much that it only took about 30 hours for the attackers to find these unbreakable keys. The Netscape story illustrates the problem of randomly generated numbers perfectly. In the majority of cases, these random numbers are in fact generated via some complex mathematical transformations from non-random numbers. Now, these such numbers are called the seed. The reliability of the entire cryptographic algorithm depends on the choice of seed values. All the same, in 1996, enthusiasts created a wonderful site called Lavrand. It would generate random numbers using, as the seed, a photograph of a few hundred lava lamps. Literally speaking, this was a beautiful solution. The Lavaran site existed from the start of the 2000s, but a few years ago, this idea was repeated by the guys at Cloudflare. They installed a hundred of these lamps in their office in San Francisco, and now they use these images to encrypt their internet traffic. In the Singapore office of the same company, they use a more classic method of generating random numbers. This technique involves using a detector to record the decay of a radioactive isotope. Each decay occurs at a totally unpredictable moment in time, so the output is a truly random number. Until recently, such systems were only used in really advanced information systems, for example, those related to bank payments. But now you too can assemble a similar device at your desk. So what expensive pieces of equipment do you need to make it happen? Well, actually, just an ordinary banana. Now, you might already know that this fruit contains a radioactive isotope, 
potassium-40. Its quantity is extremely small, but nuclear physicists in their calculations like to measure small doses of radiation in banana equivalents, an idea developed by an Italian student, Valerio Nappi. He assembled an isotope decay counter using amateur components and used bananas as a radiation source. If you're interested in giving this a try yourself, all schematics and project code are available at hackaday.io. You can find a link to it down below in the description. Now, Nappy's banana is a truly random number generator. As in the case of lava lamps, the source of randomness is outside of the computer. The program only captures and processes data from the real physical world. But buying bananas every time you're going to withdraw money from an ATM or want to chat with your colleagues over Zoom isn't the most convenient solution. So once again, we have to find a compromise between convenience and security. Hence, in programming, most of the time, we're talking about pseudo random number generators. Look at this animation. The white pattern shows truly random numbers, whereas blue is the result of a pseudo random generator. See how the blue dots gradually add up to a repeating pattern? In addition, all pseudo random number generators will sooner or later start reissuing the same values. This is called the period of the generator. For simple algorithms, the numbers will start repeating after just a few thousand uses. The most advanced of the popular algorithms, the Merson vortex, operates with prime numbers in 623 dimensions, and its period is practically unreachable. But unfortunately, even this vortex is not crypto-resistant. By the way, real randomness is not actually always desired by users. Apple programmers experienced this firsthand. When the music shuffling function worked genuinely randomly in the first generations of the iPod, Customers actually complained that their favourite tracks appeared too rarely. As a result, the algorithm had to be changed. The songs were given a rating and users' favourites began to be included more often than others. In turn, the customers were satisfied with this new random shuffling. But anyway, let's get back to data protection. How serious is the problem of bad random number generators? Let me tell you about one example. Specialists at the company Independent Security Evaluators carried out an analysis on the security of the Ethereum blockchain. They searched for keys that were generated with an error and therefore were less resistant than usual. In the words of Adrian Bednarik, they were able to find 735 of these weak keys. Now, experts also noted that dozens of these were set up to send money to the same recipient. It turned out that this method was being used by an unknown hacker. Mistakes in the generation of random numbers cost Ethereum users a minimum of $7 million. In December 2019, a group of students from Scotland, Saudi Arabia and America announced the creation of a fundamentally new and absolutely crypto secure system. They claim that the system is immune even to the fantastic capabilities of quantum computers. And it was chaos theory that helped them in their work. Guys, I've got some news for you. Tony, our chief legal officer at SunSub, just launched another exciting interview. This time, Tony interviewed Saroosh Kafiavadi, director at Kroll, the world's leading international financial investigator. Saroosh is based in Gibraltar and his 15 year long professional career is tightly linked to financial crime investigations and liaison with financial regulators such as the FCA in the UK. In this video, he and Tony discuss how various risk factors should be applied to risk management, as well as current changes in the risk status in the global geopolitical environment and his personal experience in anti-money laundering. It's a game of cat and mouse. You've surely already heard about the butterfly effect more than once. Or, in particular, the popular phrase among journalists that the flapping of a butterfly's wing can cause a hurricane on the other side of the world. Now, this phrase triggers in my imagination a whole chain of events where a small and insignificant action can lead to huge consequences. But, as in the case of Schrodinger's cat, the author of the theory actually had something completely different in mind. In 1972, Edward Lorenz, a professor of meteorology from MIT, almost forgot that he was supposed to be giving a presentation at a conference. He didn't even title his report, he just sent the thesis to the organisers at the last moment. The event's programme had to be compiled without the participation of the professor. Therefore, the author of the famous phrase was one of the members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a fan of Ray Bradbury's work, Philip Merrilies. It was he who suggested the name of Lawrence's lecture, Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wing in Brazil, 
set off a tornado in Texas. It's worth noting that this was a question and not a statement at all. In fact, Lawrence has been modeling complex processes in the Earth's atmosphere for more than a decade. In the 60s, climatologists were just beginning to master computers. The behavior of airflows was determined by a system of complex differential equations, calculations which took many hours. One day, Lawrence decided to recalculate the data he'd received a few days earlier. He ran the program a second time and got a completely different calculation. Now, it seemed impossible. The same program on the same computer with the same data, but different results. Like a real scientist, Lawrence repeated the simulation once again. The results coincided with the previous experience. As was later discovered, for the first simulation, the value of one of the system parameters was set as 0.506127, and during repeated calculations, the professor just rounded it up to 0.506. And it wasn't just a simple rounding error. The system in the climate model turned out to be quite sensitive to changes in the parameters. Minor changes unexpectedly caused an avalanche of consequences. In the famous report, Lawrence discussed his experiments using a metaphor about the flapping of a butterfly's wing. But the essence of his thesis was quite different. Firstly, if one wing stroke can cause a tornado, then all previous and all future strokes of this butterfly, as well as the strokes of the other billion insects on our planet, are also capable of doing this. And secondly, if one butterfly is capable of causing a tornado, then equally the same wing flap can prevent a catastrophe. In other words, a slight change in the source data might go unnoticed, subsequently starting a tornado or conversely stopping it. And what we usually mean by the butterfly effect is actually more correctly called the domino effect when a small falling domino topples others along the chain. Lawrence developed his ideas and created a new mathematical discipline, chaos theory. He argued that most fields of science deal with predictable phenomena, for example, chemical reactions or electrical circuits. But complex open systems are chaotic. That is, they're virtually impossible to predict. The slightest inaccuracy and we'll get an effect that in programming is called garbage in, garbage out. The hypersensitivity of the chaotic system formed the basis of a new cryptographic system. Unique cryptographic keys in this system are generated based on user fingerprints. But unlike the scanners we're used to, the pattern of the lines, or friction ridges as they're called, of the recipient and sender becomes the basis for creating a one-time key, which is equal to the size of the message. The exchange of information about keys is based on the same principle as in the case of quantum data transmission. We talked about this in detail in the video about the prospects and threats of quantum technologies, so if you're interested in this topic, be sure to take a look. In theory, such a crypto system is impossible to crack. The key exchange procedure is fully protected due to the laws of physics, and it's mathematically impossible to choose a random key that is equal to the length of the text. On the other hand, the abilities of computer technology scares me more and more every day. So you remember the story of Bradbury, which was the origin of the metaphor about the butterfly wing. If you're not familiar, it's a story about a time traveler who in the past steps on a butterfly and this radically changes the future. In mid 2020, a group of scientists from Los Alamos National Laboratory were able to repeat this experiment. They built a real time machine. Well, okay, almost real. In their work, they used a quantum computer and simulated sending a quibit, the so-called unit of information in such systems, into the past. In the past, this information was corrupted and then returned to our time. But the results surprised scientists. By the time this quibit returned to our time, it had restored its original value. It turns out that the timeline in the quantum model corrected itself. It sounds incredible. So you can travel to the past and trample not only butterflies, but also dinosaurs, and the future won't change. In practice, this means just one thing. Despite the fact that quantum technologies are gradually entering our lives, we still don't fully understand the structure of our world. And besides, in 95, Netscape's secret keys also seemed absolutely reliable. So we'll have to wait and see. Do you often check the weather forecast? And I don't mean for the next day or two, but for information about the weather at least a week ahead. The trouble is that the weather forecast prediction for a period far in the future 
is akin to telling your fortune by reading tea leaves. Chaos theory unequivocally rejects the possibility of reliable predictions at least a month in advance. Even the most accurate present moment changes turn any model into a complete absurdity. And if we can't predict the weather, then what about the future of cryptography? So far, there are a lot more questions than answers. I wouldn't even take for granted the statement about the absolute security of any system. Imagine, for example, that a quantum encryption terminal is connected to a computer that's been infected with a spyware program. How long will your secrets remain secrets then? Therefore, even if scientists manage to create an absolutely cryptographic data transmission channel, the most significant, unpredictable and chaotic factor will always remain. I'm talking about us humans. So, that is all for today, guys. My name is Emily and this is SumSub and I look forward to taking you on our next expedition through the online jungle.